So in this video, we're going to talk about the antibiotic coamoxiclav, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic. So broad spectrum means that it's able to treat a whole bunch of different infections. So it's got a broad range of infections that it effectively treats. Coamoxiclav is a wonderful antibiotic. It's incredibly effective. And as I say, it covers a huge number of different infections. However, we do think twice before prescribing it. And the reason we do is, well, one, antibiotic stewardship, so trying to prevent antibiotic resistance from emerging. But more than that, there are two side effects that coamoxiclav can have, and it's not alone in being able to cause these side effects. Other antibiotics can cause them as well, but coamoxiclav is particularly high risk for them, and they are clostridial colitis and drug-induced cholestasis. Now, they are not that common. Most people who take coamoxiclav will not get one of these side effects, but neither are they vanishingly rare. So I have seen cases, in fact, multiple cases of these side effects happen from being given coamoxiclav to people, and they are awful when they do happen. Clostridial colitis is paradoxically a bacterial infection of the colon, and it's a really bad one. It takes often weeks to self-resolve after uh, the coamoxiclav has been stopped, and it can cause really, really devastating damage to the colon. Drug-induced cholestasis, again, we'll discuss both of these more in detail later, uh, is where the liver stops moving bile properly through it, and it then leads to a backup of bilirubin in your body, and you turn yellow, and it's very, very nasty. So, as I say, other antibiotics can cause these side effects as well. There are antibiotics that are even worse, in fact, than coamoxiclav for causing clostridial colitis. And there are other antibiotics as well that can cause drug-induced cholestasis, but coamoxiclav is one of the ones that we're warned uh, can cause these two problems. And they're not vanishingly rare. I have seen cases where it does cause it. So it is a wonderful antibiotic because it covers so many different types of infections. So in particular, if you have a patient where you don't really know what's wrong with them, but you know that they've got an infection somewhere, they are sick and their inflammatory markers in their blood are raised, coamoxiclav is wonderful because it covers so many different possibilities. Um, but you do also have to think about the risk of these side effects and you wonder whether actually it would be better to give a combination of maybe three different antibiotics, each of which has a lower risk for causing these side effects and together covers the same broad range of infections as coamoxiclav, but overall is less high risk potentially for causing these side effects. So we are cautious with coamoxiclav because of the possibility of these side effects. But it is wonderful because it is just one antibiotic, one injection intravenously for the nurses to have to do three times a day rather than three separate antibiotics, which we might do as an alternative to coamoxiclav to cover the same broad range of infections. Um, AMG is the example I'm thinking of, the Mox Metangent, which is a combination of three antibiotics, three separate antibiotics that has a broad range of cover coverage as well and would be maybe an alternative to coamoxiclav um, in cases where you don't really know necessarily what's actually wrong with the patient and you want to cover for a broad range of infections therefore. So let's talk now about name because I'm probably not going to call it coamoxiclav for the rest of this video because I don't call it coamoxiclav usually. I actually call it Augmentin. So Augmentin is the initial brand name for the antibiotic coamoxiclav uh, and it's still commonly used as an alternative name for it. Uh, and it's the name I use, Augmentin, I like it. Other names you might hear it called, it's full name. So coamoxiclav is its proper name but it's really full name is amoxicillin clavulonate. So this tells you exactly what is in coamoxiclav. So it's actually got two drugs. It's a combination of two drugs in it. Amoxicillin is an antibiotic. It's a penicillin antibiotic. So penicillin isn't actually just one drug. People, um, people outside of medicine tend to think that penicillin is just one drug. It's not. There are a whole bunch of antibiotics that come under the uh, title penicillin antibiotics, and amoxicillin is one of them. If people do say penicillin and don't clarify which one they're talking about, usually they're talking about one of the original ones. So the original ones are uh, benzyl penicillin, ben pen for short, and pen penicillin v, pen v for short, uh, or in for phenoxymethyl penicillin. So usually if people say penicillin, they're talking about one of those, but we don't use those as much as we use, for example, amoxicillin. 
So now there are a whole bunch of penicillins. Uh, so it's not a single drug, it's a class of antibiotics. So it contains amoxicillin, which is a penicillin antibiotic, and then it contains clavulonate or clavulonic acid. Now that's not an antibiotic, but what it is, is something called a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Now I'll write that down. So a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So beta-lactams are an even broader classification for antibiotics. So there are a whole bunch of antibiotics that are called beta-lactam antibiotics. Uh, so get rid of the A's, and that's how you spell beta-lactam. Now, they are determined by a chemical structure. There is a structure in them called a beta-lactam ring. So all of these beta-lactam antibiotics have a certain chemical structure. Now, within that, we subdivide the beta-lactam antibiotics into different groups. And one of those groups is the penicillin antibiotics, which amoxicillin falls into. So all penicillin antibiotics are beta-lactam antibiotics, but not all beta-lactam antibiotics are penicillin antibiotics, because there are other groups within the beta-lactam group. So the cephalosporins, um, sorry, the cephalosporins is how you pronounce that, is another uh, group in the beta-lactam group. The carbapenems are another group as well. I'll just write those down. So in the group of beta-lactam antibiotics, the main subgroups in that are the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and the carbapenems. There is another final group uh, called the monobactams, but we very, very rarely use those. So these are the three main groups in the beta-lactam. Uh, major group. Um, examples of cephalosporins, cephalexin is an example, keftriaxone, which we use to treat meningitis, is another example. By the way, these antibiotics, we're very cautious of these because they are even worse than coamoxiclav augmentin for causing clostridial colitis. They're awful for causing clostridial colitis. Uh, so they're a cautious group of antibiotics that we use. Carbapenems, examples of carbapenems are meropenem, ertapenem, imipenem. They're all really, really broad spectrum antibiotics, even broader spectrum than augmentin. Uh, and they are kind of protected antibiotics. So, for example, if I want to prescribe a carbapenem to a patient, I'm not really supposed to do that. I'm supposed to get a consultant microbiologist um, who's an expert in infectious disease to sign off on the prescription for a carbapenem because they are protected antibiotics because they're so, so effective and we don't want uh, to produce antibiotic resistance against the carbapenems. Anyway, that's a side point. So beta-lactams, all of these are examples of beta-lactam antibiotics. So amoxicillin, being a penicillin, is an example of a beta-lactam antibiotic. Now, a lot of bugs have produced defences against beta-lactam antibiotics. In particular, they've produced enzymes that can break them down, and these are enzymes called beta-lactamase enzymes. Now, of course, these enzymes aren't necessarily able to break down every single beta-lactam antibiotic. For example, the carbapenems, they might not be able to break down. But some of the some of the penicillins, they are very effective at breaking down. For example, the original penicillins, like... Um, pen V and Ben Pen, they're very effective usually at breaking down those. Amoxicillin also, they're very effective at breaking down. So our next manoeuvre has been to create drugs that actually inhibit these enzymes, and that's what clavulonic acid or clavulonate is. It's something that inhibits the beta-lactamase enzyme. So if a bug has defended itself against amoxicillin by producing a beta-lactamase enzyme, this drug will then inhibit that, and then the amoxicillin will be able to work against the bacteria to kill it, despite the fact that it has this defensive beta-lactamase. So that's what augmentin is. It's the combination of amoxicillin clavulonate. Other final names that you might hear coamoxiclav called, you can hear it called coamox for short, and sometimes even coa for short. This is in contrast to another antibiotic that's broad spectrum called cotrimoxazole, which I'll write down. So there's this other antibiotic that is not a beta-lactam antibiotic called cotrimoxazole that is also a combination of two drugs. That's the reason for the co. Co is meaning that it's got two drugs in. And you can see the name has been formed out of amoxicillin and then clavulonic acid. So cotrimoxazole likewise contains an antibiotic called trimethoprim and another antibiotic called sulfamethoxazole and that's where its combined name has come from. It's another very broad spectrum antibiotic, and you might hear it referred to as Cotrimox 
or Coty for short, and it's famous brand name is Cetrin, so all of these are names for this drug. I'm not going to talk more about this drug uh, in this video. The video is about Kermoxiclav. However, just to make you aware that that's sort of like, these names are kind of similar to the corresponding names for Cotrimoxazole. So Augmentin is CoA and Cetrin is CoT. So now let's talk about some of the infections that we can treat with Kermoxiclav. So firstly, chest infections can be treated with Kermoxiclav. So pneumonia means infection in the actual lung tissue, so it's a really severe chest infection, but less severe chest infections, such as infections that are in the airways, the lower airways that are in the lungs, but not the actual lung tissue itself, uh, those can also be treated uh, with Kermoxiclav. When they're bacterial, of course, if it's a viral infection caused by flu or relevant at the moment, coronavirus, uh, then it won't be effective. Um, but if it's a bacterial infection or if you've got secondary bacterial infection on top of the viral infection, such as flu or coronavirus, uh, then Kermoxiclav can be used to treat that. So it can be used to treat pneumonia and lower respiratory tract infections, LRTI is what we would call infections that are in the airways. Uh, but not the lung tissue. So I've added that in here. So LRTI, lower respiratory tract infection. So that means infections in the airways in the lungs, but not actually in the lung tissue itself. Once it's actually in the lung tissue itself, the alveolar tissue, the parenchymal tissue of the lungs, uh, we'd call that then pneumonia. So both of those are severe types of chest infections, lower respiratory tract infection and pneumonia. Pneumonia though is even severer than lower respiratory tract infection. So if you've got a bacterial pneumonia or a bacterial lower respiratory tract infection, Augmentin is usually incredibly effective at treating that. There are certain types of pneumonia. Pneumonia caused by very strange bugs that Augmentin wouldn't be effective at. So for example, if you've got pseudomonal pneumonia or pseudomonal lower respiratory tract infection, which people with bronchiectasis, which is a condition of the airways where the airways become really, really dilated. So if you imagine your airways being a normal sort of calibre, uh, in people with bronchiectasis, they become huge, absolutely enormous. They can become enormous, really, really enormous when you see them on CT sometimes. Uh, and that's called bronchiectasis when that happens. And there's a whole bunch of reasons it can happen. Um, often it's not possible to identify exactly why it has happened for a person. It might have been that they've had a really severe infection as a child and we pin it on that, the reason that 30 years later they've developed bronchiectasis. Or people with really severe asthma for years and years and years, they can develop bronchiectasis. People with cystic fibrosis always end up developing bronchiectasis in the end uh, from that condition. Anyway, the problem with bronchiectasis is that they're really at risk of getting infections in these bronchiectatic airways. Uh, and in particular, they often get pseudomonal infections and Augmentin wouldn't be effective against that. You'd need a, a, an even stronger antibiotic or an anti-pseudomonal antibiotic. And indeed, there is an even broader spectrum penicillin antibiotic called Tazazin that does hit uh, pseudomonas. Uh, so it's a combination antibiotic again of uh, piperacillin is the penicillin that's in it. And then Tazobactam is actually a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Uh, but it ends up being broader spectrum than Augmentin. It hits pretty much everything that Augmentin hits, plus it hits Pseudomonas. Uh, but most pneumonias and lower respiratory tract infections are not Pseudomonas. Uh, and would be hit by Augmentin. The main bugs that cause pneumonia, cause chest infections, are hit by Augmentin. There are a few such as Pseudomonas, and there are other ones as well that won't be hit. Uh, I think Legionella isn't hit by um, Augmentin, uh, but don't quote me on that. But there are other atypical infections that can happen in the lungs that Augmentin wouldn't hit. But the main ones, 80% of chest infections, uh, will be effectively treated by Augmentin. Other infections that we can treat uh, with Augmentin, uh, urine infections usually will be hit by Augmentin as well. So urine infections are usually E. coli and E. coli is often sensitive to Augmentin. Uh, so we can treat urine infections with uh, Augmentin. So often when people come in, um, sometimes to hospital really ill. We don't really know where the infection is coming from initially. It might be coming from their urine, it might be coming from their chest, it might be coming from their abdomen. The brilliance is that if we give Augmentin, 
um, we hit all of these, or we stand a good chance of hitting all of these. I mean, of course, again, just like when we were talking about the chest, uh, there are examples of bugs that can cause urine infections that wouldn't be hit by augmentin. And indeed, there are horrible strains of E. coli that will be resistant to augmentin. But many urine infections will be sensitive to augmentin and therefore will get better with augmentin.